Canadians are drunk on debt. Hi, everyone, and welcome to this episode of the Vancouver Life Real Estate Podcast and YouTube channel. We are getting the data here from Q1 2022, and things are still very elevated. But as you know, definitely if you've listened or watched to our last couple episodes, that things are changing quick. We want to kind of give a, an overview here of what's happening nationally again and, and how much it's affecting each end of our country and, of course, what to expect going forward. So first off, let's just talk a little bit here on the activity levels. So if we remember, 2021 was the highest sales volume ever recorded by a massive 20% margin. 20% more homes sold last year than any other year in history. It was just, it was just fanatical <laughs> from coast to coast here. And what's happened is it has carried over into Q1. And that's not a surprise here. We saw January, February, March with really, really big numbers, especially locally here. Um, and of course, yeah, it's Q2 now and things are changing. But Q1, about 25% higher transaction volume than, you know, the 15-year norms. So still incredibly active. Um, Ryan, would you say we definitely felt that ourselves here? Yeah, I, I mean, it was, it was bananas. I mean, there's really no other way to kind of say it. Uh, frenetic would be maybe the word I would use. I mean, I think, you know, generally speaking, when you when you look at it from a macro perspective, it was, you know, we dropped interest rates to all time lows. We poured gas on a on a fire that already had, um, you know, systemic supply issues, um, and you know, very very aggressive immigration numbers. So, uh, it doesn't surprise me that it's at twenty five percent. The question I think is, is that healthy, right? <laughs> yeah, well, exactly. And I think that's what we're starting to see now is how potentially unhealthy that really is. And mm -hmm. uh, yeah, the state of the union here is is changing radically. And, you know, when we look at these numbers, these elevated sales from the last year in Q1 here, uh, it came in that the dollar volume of these home sales relative to our GDP set a record in 2021, no surprise, um, and into 2022 here, sitting at about 50% higher than the 2016 peak, which was the previous one. Wow. 50% higher. Wow. So, I mean, again, it just goes to show how important the housing market is to our country. And again, this oh, is yeah. why we say it's, it's, it's a fixed system. It's rigged and, uh, you know, don't shoot the messenger, but to uh, just understand that this is why things are happening the way they are and why we firmly believe that, yes, while things are starting to turn downwards, you're going to see a protected low end of about, I think, 15% here in price reduction overall before we start seeing things being stimulated again. Yeah, it's, it's cyclical. Uh, I mean, the, the thing is, is this one's particularly volatile. Right, that's the big difference here, um, and, and obviously the pandemic either extended or you know inflated the issue more than it al already was. But really, it exacerbated an issue that already existed. Just <laughs> dropping our interest rates to the place we did, and then holding them there, and not responding when we knew things were changing. That to me is still a bit puzzling, and and honestly speaking, it, you know the the Bank of Canada, in my opinion, kind of lost some credibility there. I can see that. Yeah, I think that, <laughs> that speaks too to the overall sentiment that's being felt out there. You know, understandably, mm -hmm. 2021, people were all high on housing, if you will. And, and, and real estate sentiment was the most bullish it had ever been. You know, record highs basically from Q2 of 2021 until now. Um, <clears throat> and though, yeah, you know, things are changing quick, obviously, thanks to the recent rate hikes. And sentiment is on the way down mm -hmm. though it is important to note that by the end of q1 here it was still above the previous peaks of uh, around that again uh 2016 2017 tail end of that bull run yeah i i, I mean i think these numbers are, are probably always going to appear that way as we continue to increase in in population as well right so i mean it, it, to me, even though the numbers keep going up, keep going up, what I think is scary is like the velocity of the number and, and like how quickly that's happened in this short period of time. That to me is the, is the real scary part. The numbers are going to grow. The numbers are always going to grow as long as we continue to you know, um, continue to bring people here. Um, so uh, it's just to me, it's the, it's the volatility of it that's 
scary. And I think now we're starting to see what some of that volatility has done, right? Uh, the full effects of the pandemic, the, the full effects of the decisions we decided to do inside of our economy haven't been felt yet. We're only just starting to see them, right? We, we went through probably the big first phase. And now we're going to see some of the you know consequences too of these decisions. <laughs> yeah, of course, because you can't typically buy that many homes without mortgages and without increasing debt. And that's, that's really right. what we're starting to see the ramifications of now. I mean, um, you got to talk about the rate of new mortgages, obviously similar to the rate of new home sales. It's new mortgages came in at almost double the rate of 2017. So the previous wow. peak, wow. we're talking about $150 billion higher uh, than that time. And right now it's the latest tally, uh, $250 billion worth of new mortgages in the last 12 months. Wow. A quarter trillion dollars in mortgages in the last year. Oh, um, so understandably, you know, new mortgages to GDP ratio is, is at all times high, all time high, excuse me. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, household GDP, uh, sorry, the household debt to GDP ratio is at 110%. Uh, this is 40 points higher than the G20 average and Canada is the third highest in this regard, only behind Switzerland and Australia, who we also know has crazy housing market as well. Right. Yeah, the um, my neighbor's best friend is Australian, and he was just saying he's talking to all his friends back home, and he said right now the rental market is absolutely absurd. It is next to impossible to find any rental market or any rental units there now. Um, people that were literally pushed out of housing because it got so expensive got pushed into the rental market at a rate where they have never had lower vacancy, and of course that means higher rental rates. And uh, yeah, apparently it, it, it's painful there right now for renters as well. Yeah, that that just to me, when we start seeing things like this, typically re recessions follow. So <laughs> when you start to see, you know, people getting priced out of being able to buy assets and, and going into higher and higher interest, whether that's with banks or whether that's paying mortgage, which is essentially interest, or sorry, not mortgage, rent, which is essentially an interest. Uh, you know, people can't save anymore, right? Disposable income is going down things are going to start to slow. It's coming. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, I mean, take a look at the household debt to disposable income ratio. I mean, understandably, that has to be at an all-time high here, but we're sitting at about 180%. Yeah. Household debt to disposable income at 180%. It's, yeah, you can see this thing being stretched to the absolute limit. Well, where that gets scary too, Dan, is when people, um, when people are on like a fixed income, right? So- if if you if you can't increase your income, um, that that's getting really scary, right? Because that's just windling away more and more and more of the income you have towards your debt, uh, and and that's you've got now no more no more money going into the economy, which helps turn and create more income, right? So it's a bit of a scary cycle, this part, <laughs> mm -hmm. especially with that number being as high as it is. Yeah, and of course, part of what caused that was the housing prices, right? Mm -hmm. If we have housing yeah. at all-time high prices, um, you have to think people that are just having to get in or feel they need to, or are just doing it regardless, for the most part, were getting pushed to choose variable mortgages just so they could afford those payments. Yep. Because your spread's a good 2% right now, and, and that's yep. gonna equal hundreds and hundreds of dollars per month in your payment. So right now, about 55% of all new mortgages are people choosing to go variable. That is very high. And for reference, <laughs> it was about 18% in 2020. Jeez. Big gap. Okay. So, wow. sorry, I misquoted 8%. Yeah, in I was going to say. Yeah, yeah. So it's gone from <laughs> 8 to, to 55, which is resulting in about um, a total of one third, about 33% of all mortgages active today are variable. And, and that number, that's the 18 I was talking about. That's up from 18% in 2020. So, almost double in just two years. Well, and this is what makes it, uh, for lack of a better term, um, a, an interesting problem for the Bank of Canada, because now everybody's kind of a partner in these rate increases, right? It's not like it used to be where the vast majority of people were locked in. There's a, a bunch of people out there who have more debt than they've ever had and are facing increasing payments with it, um, or payments that are getting diluted to interest pushing out the cost of ownership, 
right? So it's, it's a, it's a more sensitive uh, situation than it's ever been. And, you know, that's kind of my critique with the bank. They, you know, how could you not have known this? Um, <laughs> and then deciding you're going to do 50 basis point hikes, one after the other, after the other, after the other, it's going to crush buyers. It's going to break their backs. Right. And I just don't think it's a very credible thing to do. And you got to think some of the blame, if you will, it's going to land on the lenders as well. Um, mm -hmm. Because if you've ever gone for a mortgage or a loan, you know that you have to hit their debt servicing ratios, which is typically right. about 44%, right? Your total uh, debts must only be about 44% of your total gross income. Now, one in four mortgages in the last year were issued at a rate higher than that 44%. One in four. Wow. Um, 8% were issued at or above a 60% debt servicing ratio. Ooh. So, you know, this is, this number is, is, is increasing. So these uh, banks are finding ways to approve people outside of, again, the sort of industry standard percent of debt ratio servicing. Obviously, we don't know the whole story about all these, but, um, you know, it's you look a little bit to the states and what happened in the global financial crisis when anyone who could fog a mirror could get a mortgage or two mm -hmm. or three. Mm -hmm. And, you know, Canada didn't suffer as, as bad because we are a little a lot more protective of the debt service ratio. But again, we're seeing it get squeezed up. So 25 percent, one in four right now are being, being issued above your industry standard debt service ratio. Well, so and you're kind of potentially, sorry to interrupt, but potentially yeah. putting people into a higher risk window, if you will, um, you know, with, with them thinking it's probably okay because the bank said it's okay. I wouldn't say potentially, I would say definitely. I mean, the other side of that is, you know, it's not like it's, you know, the, the, the stat we're reading here is over 60%. So, you know, is that 70%? <laughs> is that 75%? I don't know, right? Is it 61%? It's hard to know, but I can tell you that the debt service ratio of 44% compared to 60%, that's a huge jump, right? So even just that jump alone is, you know, it's worrying in my opinion. Well, and look at, look at the typical payments in both British Columbia and Ontario. 53% of pre-tax income is going to mortgages on average. Yeah. Pre-tax. Yeah. Yep. I mean, what's post-tax? Tax, some people are taxed 40%. I mean, yep. that's, that's your entire budget right there. Well, <laughs> well that's, that's it, right? I, I, I think, and you got to think, not just from the household perspective, but from the, um, you know, the economy's perspective too, that's a lot of money not entering the economy, right? That's, that's just money that is servicing debt, which, you know, leaves people cash poor and equity rich. So, it's not very good for low income or medium income people, right? Or people who are on fixed income. This is where this is going to get tough. So, um, you know, and, and then on top of that, if those people can't spend in, in retail and into the economy, then that will start to stag as well, right? And this is, this is a very quick way to lower inflation. Yeah. I mean, look at the stock market. You yeah. can't erase, what was it, 53 odd trillion dollars in wealth. Um, without that affecting the country's bottom line. And so if people yeah. stop spending or spending way less, of course, inflation is going to come down too. Yeah. So it may yeah. happen relatively quick compared to historical. That's why it's been so volatile, right? Yeah. That's what I'm, that's what I've been saying. It's just like, it's, yeah, these corrections take place, but as we continue down this path, they seem to be getting bigger and, and more volatile and closer together. <laughs> mm -hmm. So again, talking about people being stretched just to get into housing here, um, listen to this one. So the amount of mortgages issued with the minimum down payment. So these are, you know, generally first time home buyers. Uh, this is all under a million dollars and this is first homes, not rentals because it's 5% doubled. So in 2020, it was about 11% of mortgages were issued to people with, you know, the absolute minimum down doubled to 22% in 2021. High risk. It's all high, high risk. risk. That's high risk. Yes, these are insured, but again, that that insurance is, is more money on top of the existing cost of purchasing. That's right. So uh, that's a lot. Almost a quarter. Well, let's call it one in five homes were bought with the minimum down in the last twelve months. Whew. Yeah, 
stretched. So yeah. yes, we are, you know, the people obviously most at risk are the ones who are stretched over, over indebted minimum down payments within the last 12 to 24 months. And using that, Again, using right? HELOCs or things like that, right? Mm -hmm. That's where they're going to be feeling it. Yeah. Okay. So it gets uh, even deeper here. So Canadian house prices versus disposable incomes, they've basically detached from reality. Because when you look, you look to the States and the rate of Canadian house prices versus disposable incomes, it's almost been on par for like 40 years. They're mm -hmm. the same. Mm -hmm. Where up here in Canada, well, it's about two and a half times higher than disposable incomes. That's... I mean, and that's happened again in a relatively very short period of time, right? That's again, yeah. if this happens over a long period of time, it's a different kind of conversation, but this is happening quickly, right? And, and I think that that's, you know, like we talked about, like, like the stat says, it's been almost identical for 40 years and now it's, it's gone completely detached from reality, right? So what's happening? we pumped a lot of money into our system, a lot. <laughs> we keep yeah. going back to this, but it's a big reason why. And it's something that the Bank of Canada won't talk about, mm -hmm. right? I mean, you, you look at these growths, 40% in two years, 30% in two years. It's all very similar to the amount of money supply that's been injected in, in the last two to three years. They look to have started to detach right around 2004, so, you know, uh, 1980 up to 2004, pretty much on par with each other up until 2004, 2005. And that's when it just became removed. And of course, mm -hmm. yeah, like you said, completely went parabolic in just the last two years. Yeah. But yet, but yet America was able to essentially stay in line. I mean, likely because their incomes are a lot higher. Their taxes aren't quite the same. So it's different. Mm-hmm. Okay, well, let's let's make it a little scarier here, <laughs> potentially. So I don't, la I don't laugh because I don't mean to scare people, but no, no, no. just because no, it's just yeah, the news news is piling up here. Yeah. So residential investment in Canada here accounts for about forty two percent of all gross fixed capital formation. What does that mean, or why is that scary? Well, it's on par here with what we saw in Ireland, Greece, and Spain at the height of their respectable bubbles. Yep. So we're seeing similar yep. investment amounts into residential housing that happened in those three countries before their bubble bursts and some haven't fully recovered yet. Yeah. I mean, there's, now, there's a lot sorry, of, it's, there's it's, still some differences, but. Well, there's a lot. Yeah, of course. Right. This is yeah. one metric, you know, we're yeah. throwing a lot of stuff here and we'll tie it up at the end here with maybe some positive news. But again, these are, these are facts that can't be denied, denied. you know? Okay. Next one's yours. Well, I, yeah. I mean, when you look at residential investment and then you add in new housing, renovations, ownership, transfer costs, they are adding up to nearly 10% of Canadian GDP. That's 3% higher than the prior peaks at 7%. So the residential investment plus household consumption has accounted for 85% of real GDP growth over the last five years. We are so invested in our housing market, right? This is why it's so sensitive. And also why I think the government won't let it correct beyond a certain point too, right? It's mm -hmm. something, you know, it's, it's at 85% of real GDP growth over the last five years being in essentially the real estate sector. <sighs> that's way, that's, that's way too far to one side, in my opinion. Yeah. <laughs> and, and getting, well, now anyway, getting harder to, again, service in the sense right. that, okay, two things. Um, well, inflation <laughs> came yeah. out this week at 6.8%. Highest since 91. I think anyone today would say that's largely driven by food and gas. Yeah. Um, and of course, this is pushing real wage growth into the negatives because, yes, wages are not increasing at the rate of inflation. So, real wage growth is sitting around minus 3.4%. So, everything's more expensive and your dollar's worth less. And now all of a sudden, you know, you look at your housing, at your mortgage rates and, and fixed rates across all banks are above 4% now. And this is the first time they've been this high 
in 12 years. Since 2010, you have to go back to see that. Um, wow. Understandably, I mean, this is this is just crushing affordability. Where you know, if you want to buy the typical Canadian house, which is about seven hundred fifty thousand bucks, that same payment has increased by about eight hundred dollars from just six months ago. Holy cow! Well, I mean, it really is. It's begging the question, you know. In, in, over the last, I know it's we're saying here since twenty ten, but if let's take the last four or five years, you know, is it really, has, have home values really gone up by 30%, you know, 40% or have we just really debased our currency by a relative amount where, you know, this inflation now has caused such an issue. The printing of money has caused such an issue that we just, you know, we need a whole lot more money to buy the same things. Right. Mm -hmm. And when wages don't connect to that, when wages don't go up by the similar amount or on par, you, the, the, the wealth gap is insane. People just will never catch up. Right. Inflation is, it's just robbing people of their, of their, of their value. Right. Mm -hmm. Well, and this has pushed the consumer confidence numbers lower than they were pre-COVID. Totally. And so, you know, two years of being drunk on helicopter money, you know, <laughs> I think people are coming down off that high and yeah. they're, you know, everything else is trending downward. So they're like, okay, this doesn't feel as good as it did from since, you know, basically pre-COVID. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, there's things like the savings rate. I mean, we talked a lot about this during COVID because people yeah. couldn't spend. So their saving rate was incredibly high. It's yeah. still higher than pre-COVID, but the downward trend is cliff-like, I will say, in these charts. I mean, it's yeah. it went straight up, but now it's coming straight down because, yeah. again, pe people can spend and now they have to spend a lot more to do the same things they would have That's it. two years ago. That's it. That's exactly it, right? So... Well, and, and housing's being affected by this as well, right? Naturally, uh, as soon as people don't have this, the amount of money to spend that they they thought they had, uh, major purchases um, they come they're usually the first to come off the table, right? Um, so, you know, we're going to start to really see prices change here soon as well. As you know, it's it's again it's a lagging indicator, but with inventory that's building quickly, buyers that are stepping back. Um, Prices are next. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we saw the first national home sale price reduction since April 2020. Right. We know what happened in April 2020. The market was closed. Anything yeah. that sold was was pretty much in a panic. So yeah. prices dropped then. They went parabolic for two years. And we just saw last month the first national home price decline since mm. then. Mm -hmm. um, you got to think in uh, Toronto, too, they're getting hit especially hard. They just saw the largest monthly decline for any month dating back to 2017. Holy Toronto dropped cow. about 1.8% last month alone. And Oof. you got to think, if you're stretched, what's the first thing you're going to offload? Most likely your vacation property when we're talking mm -hmm. about housing here. Yeah. So things like, especially in like, you know, uh, Toronto, Ontario, uh, cottages went crazy for the last couple of years. They saw some of the biggest rate hike appreciation, or sorry, appreciation rate increases in history. Over here, closer to home, things like Whistler, of course, went parabolic. We saw Sunshine Coast. A lot of these um, uh, Gulf Island properties went nuts. So, again, if you got into that with a non-fixed variable payment, maybe those new payments are starting to scare you and you just want to offload that before getting into any type of scary debt. Mm -hmm. So, I expect to see those properties coming up a lot, probably post-summer. People might get that one more season out of it um, by fall. I... I uh, if this trend continues the way it is, I think we're going to see a lot of that type of property hit the market at uh, reducing prices. I also would say it's, you know, especially in Whistler um, and, and those markets that are, that are very tight in terms of inventory, where you saw massive increases in price, they will probably be the sharpest declines as well, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So yeah, the pendulum swings, right? When it swings yeah. that fast, that far, it tends to come back. Yeah. And yeah. I think maybe before we get into the, maybe the bit of the light here, why don't you share some of these, uh, these stories we've been hearing about on either end of the country here. About yeah. So there's extreme <laughs> stories. Yeah. There's, um, so it's a mixture of tweets and stuff from Reddit, but we're seeing, um, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll quote, uh, uh, 
this guy called Condo Chris. Um, I'll bleep some of it out, but um, he says here, just got off the phone with a couple of real estate brokers and I can confirm that they are freaking the F out. Lots of agents with clients that have bought e-homes before they listed theirs and are now stuck. Appraisals are not coming in and buyers are offering huge money for mutual releases. Another one states here, I'm hearing stories of appraisals falling short, 50 to 200K, some on firm deals, Oof. right? So no one, no one is really seeing the full picture and what's really going on. You know, um, buyers are wanting to back out of purchases and, and sellers are price dropping. Uh, it's just, a, it's a far cry from two years ago, right? Uh, this is the last one I'll say. This one's crazy. Um, this one I was actually uh, submitted as anonymous. Um, says, I sold my house for $1.3 million. The buyer's offer is firm and getting closed in a week. The time between uh, um, the offer and closing was 90 days. Below is my query to the bank mortgage specialist in this group. How many times does the bank verify and appraise a property before closing? Asking this question because our buyer's bank has appraised this property twice. And then the first time they agreed to the selling price, but the second time it was 150K less than the selling price. The buyer is now struggling to make ends meet and we are stuck with a house to close as well. Oh my goodness. What a mess. Wow. Think about that. You, you had a firm deal. The bank said yes. Two and a half months goes by and they reappraise the property at today's price, which as we know in places like Toronto is down almost 2% just last month and it doesn't <laughs> qualify anymore. Wow, that's a tough phone call to receive. They don't have your back, <laughs> right? And, you know, uh, that's, that's a, like I said, especially if you're on a fixed income, right? Or, you, you know, you're working at your absolute maximums. That's terrifying. Yeah, okay. So for the most part, we're talking about people that have bought within the last six to 12 months, you know, mm -hmm. and it's this very unique window of time that's happened where we've gone from fastest rising rates in history to what looks like they're going to drop very quickly as well. Now, again, mm -hmm. they're not going to go minus 50% or anything like that, but they are going to drop and that's just going to scare people. And, and of course, the stories that we hear are the extreme ones. Mm -hmm. You don't largely hear about the guy who bought five years ago and is totally fine and happy with his, yeah. you know, rates and payments and everything else. But so a bit of light here, uh, or a bit of the other side of the coin. Um, there's still no real signs of distress in the sense that insolvencies are 40% lower than pre-COVID. Like wow. very low, incredibly wow. low, all-time low, okay? Um, credit card payments, all-time high, delinquencies, all-time low in the credit card space. And that's the first thing, right? People are going to default on a credit card before they default on a mortgage. Correct. One million percent. Correct. So yeah. those are circ currently, excuse me, at all time lows. So no panic there yet. Homeowner equity, all time high, all time high at 76%. That means the average homeowner in Canada has 76% equity to 24% debt on their house. Wow. Tons of padding there, if you will, for uh, protecting from a downside. And lastly, the asset to debt ratio, one that is so rarely talked about yet is so vitally important. $7 in assets for every $1 in debt is where the yeah. average typical Canadian sits today. Uh, for reference, again, in 2010, that was $5.50 to every $1 in debt. So all time high here. Canadians have more assets to debt than any time in history. I wonder how that would stack up against other countries too. It'd be interesting to know out of the G20 nations. It would. Great thing yeah. we should dig up for the next one here. But, so um, I, again, yeah. with the vast majority of Canadians in that very solvent position, you know, the panic isn't there yet. Yes, it's being eroded and being eroded quickly, um, but the panic button is far from being hit for the vast majority of Canadians. Um, you know, headlines are going to tell you otherwise because there's going to be some radical stories out there, but don't take that for being the national average. Yeah, and, and let's remind everybody to never ever make a, a panic sell right? Never do those things. Have discussions. Um, make sure you there's, you know, you're working with trusted professionals, right? Because, you know, same with your in the stocks right now, there's a lot of people that are starting to panic and, and selling, right? To try and cover whatever they've got left. Well, you know, if interest rates all of a sudden overcorrect, and then they've got to stimulate again, what do you think is going to happen to the stocks, right? So it's, you know, 
panicking is 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 the least advisable thing to do right now. I would sit and watch at budget and, and try and get through this period, which is going to be a short-term pain, right? It's going to be some short-term pain, but the long-term, again, I, I'm still bullish long-term here. Just in the short run, we have to go through a correction. Yep. And it's heading that way and that's fine. The market cycles. So if you are thinking of panic selling or panic buying or hodling, whatever you want to do, <laughs> we'd love to just have a phone call and uh, just, you know, do a, a bit of a deep dive into your specific scenario. And we will advise what we think is the best outcome on either way. And of course, introduce you to fantastic brokers or whatever else you need within our power team. So thanks as always for watching and listening and have a fantastic day. Thanks.